Good afternoon. We're all here for some full stack development. Um, now, I know the I know the theme of the conference is um, software jungle, and I'm really tempted to use lots of references into that, but at the moment, I can't help myself. It's November 2019, and I, there's only one reference that's valid, and that's Blade Runner, um, although we can do a slight adaptation here, and at least begins with L. Um, uh, but yes, of course, I want to provide you, the, how, do, how do we get through a jungle? Um, with a machete, a clear path. And in case you're wondering how to watch the um, first six Star Wars films, what is the order, correct order for that? The correct order, uh, if you want to watch all of them, is the machete ordering, which is four, five, two, three, six. Okay. Um, go and Google that one. You may notice I left out one. There's about five minutes of one that's relevant. Um, okay, so that's enough film references. Uh, so that's Lithuania. Um, let's go to the UK. So I did this search this week on LinkedIn. Full stack developer in the UK. Over 7,000 results. Wow. And some of them require quite a lot of you. You've got to be passionate and driven. I presume that passion is how we get baby developers. I'm not quite sure about that one. Um, and driven, you can be focused. In other words, we're, we're not going to provide you with any motivation. You better come with your own motivation. You better be self, self motivating, is this is really dull. You're going to need to have deep reserves of passion to get through this, not just anger. Why does this not work? However, I want to, uh, we'll start off by looking at how we think about this terminology. These days, we talk about this, this, this term, full stack development. And what I've learned is that it covers front end development and back end development. And that's kind of it. It's, this is called full stack. Turns out there's a little bit more to the world than this. And there's uh, um, all kinds of other things. This is not an exclusive list, but it turns out that there's a bunch of other things that probably qualify. You see, your stack goes all the way down. Uh, it's kind of all these people who call themselves full stack developers, but it's just like, have you ever done the device driver work? Honestly, it's not as exciting as it sounds. Or maybe it doesn't sound very exciting at all, in which case, yes, it is that exciting. Um, but all of this other stuff is kind of interesting. Um, so I guess really that's full stack development. Uh, and a lot of things that I get called full stack are, from what I can tell, it's um, here, do you know JavaScript and of a database. Um, and, you know, I, my background is in systems programming, so starting from C, um, but I did, I did have a conversation with uh, somebody who sort of said, yeah, you know, C is too low level and weird. They were a JavaScript programmer. How could they say this? JavaScript turns out is very low level. Um, for example, there's the Spectre and Meltdown of um, uh, speculative execution in the firmware. It turns out that that manifests itself right at the top level. Anyway, I don't know why I'm talking about this, because that's full stack development. That's not what this talk is about. That's actually the correct way to talk about that kind of development. What I'm here talking about is full stack development, which is slightly different. It's actually about stacks. It is about the computer science structure, a stack. Possibly the most overused example in the history of computer science, if not the most overspecified example. And yet, we don't fully understand it, or people don't get as much from it as they can. So I want to be able to, I want to use that today to kind of take a random walk through some elements of computer science that may be of use for you, and if nothing else, they should be reasonably entertaining. Um, so, ooh, that color on that has come out terribly. That's brilliant, I love it. Um, I have a slide later on that actually uses more pink, so I'm looking forward to that, and you can look forward to it now. Um, so I edited this book a few years ago, uh, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. Um, and in it, um, J.C. Van Winkle um, included uh, this observation, um, this, this recommendation, use the right algorithm and data structure. Um, and this is kind of classic computer science stuff. And everybody thinks, oh, I don't really need to worry about that. But it turns out you do, because it makes a huge difference depending on the language and the environment that you're in, um, uh, how you think about these things. And it turns out if you want to talk about stacks and you kind of go back to uh, 1960, um, you know, uh, old school programming language, Lisp, um, 
uh, many people say, well, you know, Lisp was the last and first programming language. And it turns out that if you're working in Lisp, um, stacks are really simple, just linked lists. And the primitive, the whole language is structured around primitives for, lists, uh, for stack operations. It turns out you don't have to do any work. Uh, if you've got a stack, and that's a, link, a singly linked list in memory, then that operation gives you the top element. This operation is a pop. And cons is a push. That's it. We're done. We can go home. That was a quick talk. Well, I mean, for some people, basically the last 60 years of um, software development has been simply waiting for hardware to allow you to do Lisp and Lisp ideas properly. Um, but you've got to understand your data structures. Um, you've got to understand what they cost and the concepts that are used um, for them. Uh, and that's concrete data types. In particular, you know, insertion to a regular linked list has a cost of 01. You need to understand complexity, but if you add a cryptographic hash to every link and an insertion can cost one megawatt hour. Um, this is the basis of uh, Bitcoin, um, blockchain, and various other, um, they're called currencies, but they're speculative assets. So um, just as with speculative execution, there are surprises to be had there. Let's talk about, that's a concrete data structure. Let's talk about the abstract data st uh, structure stuff. Because ADTs are one of the most influential ideas, even though people often don't work in languages that express them directly, they have hugely shaped our thinking. And this is, uh, comes out of the work of Barbara Liskoff um, in the early 1970s. You may recognize her name from the Liskoff Substitution Principle. Yes, it's that Barbara Liskoff, um, winner of the Turing Award. Um, and it, this paper in 1974 really talks about what do we mean um, how do we reason in these things? What is the purpose of this stuff? An abstract data type defines a class of abstract data objects which is completely characterized by the operations available in those objects. Now, for a lot of people, they think, wait a minute, this is object orientation. Yeah, sort of. They overlap. But the fundamental idea is data abstraction. She's not talking about anything else here. Um, most of what we think of as being good with OO is actually, it overlaps and comes from the ADT world. Uh, the fact they use the word object as well uh, perhaps adds to the confusion or means that people remember less about ADTs. The program is concerned only with the behavior which that object exhibits, but not with any details of how that behavior is achieved by means of an implementation. So that's kind of an interesting segue. Let's actually talk about um, stacks. So here's a stack of books um, that are about objects. Uh, and let's say, stack of books, how do I talk about it without talking about its implementation? Programmers are very drawn towards the implementation. It's sometimes very difficult to separate people's thinking about how do I implement something from how, is it, uh, from how do I reason about it, how do I think about it, how do I use it. This idea of usage is quite important. We're going to see that informs the way we think about tests. This is a very unifying subject. Now, if I think about stack, what can I do with uh, stack? Well, there's a bunch of operations. I can create one, I can push, pop, I can find the depth, and I can find the top element. Now, that's not enough to give you a model of reasoning. I could sit there and dig into the maths, uh, in, into a maths book, and come up with this, which is just a gratuitous excuse for me to use an upside down A and a back to front E in a talk. Um, this is um, uh, for, all, uh, for all types T, so this is generic. There is a thing called a stack, which is basically a Cartesian product of, or it's actually a, sorry, a tagged product uh, of five operations or um, five fields. Um, which give you these basic behaviors. Um, and you know, that's great. That gives me some types. We'll come back to the fact that these guys are slashed here. These are partial functions. These are full functions, or total functions. Um, a total function can be called at any time. A partial function basically means you can't always call this. It doesn't always mean something useful. It's not always defined. Um, so what is the top of an empty stack? Okay, that's an interesting one. What happens if I pop an empty stack? That's an interesting one. So this is an idea of undefined behavior. However, apart from the types and that partial versus total distinction, this is not enough to talk about this without an implementation. Well, no, we can go back. We can sit there and sort of sketch out a Java class, get something there. I guess if you're a Java programmer, you might think, oh, you know, I need to use the word get somewhere because it's not obvious what depth and top mean. Maybe I should put the word get, because that will help people. Okay? Honestly, I think Java programmers are not committed enough. You, if you're going to do it, do it, okay? I want to get that, I want to do this. And it's like, really, that you should only have three prefixes in, the, well, maybe four if we allow is. But in all of your Java code, it should be get, set, do. 
Okay? We don't want, we don't want to have meaningful words. We want to fill the world with noise. Um, however, I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to focus on that. And then I'm going to take you back on a journey to 1969. So 50 years ago, an axiomatic basis for computer programming. Uh, Tony Hall. This is kind of like the beginning of formal methods. How do I reason about behavior? Okay, so this is quite an interesting one because this kind of introduces an idea. Now, the notation that he used in the original paper is this, PQR. He said, is if the assertion P is true before initiation of a program Q, then the assertion R will be true on its completion. And these days, we use slightly adapted notation, and that is precondition, action, post-condition. That's, that's where all this comes from. Um, we can apply this kind of reasoning to stack. Um, and this gives us what has become known as the programming by contract model, which uh, was contrived in the 1980s by Bertram Meyer, but it is basically just Hall's work, or formal methods work, just applied to um, regular code. What is the post-condition of the constructor? Well, the depth is zero. That's the post-condition. Once I've called it, that's the one thing I can guarantee. What about push? Okay. Where the pre-depth is the depth before you called it, the post-condition is that the depth is the pre-depth plus one, and the top is whatever you just pushed. Cool. Top, pre-condition, can't be empty. Post-condition, it'll have one less element. The depth, yeah, you can actually find that this is not very exciting. The depth is... Well, it can't be negative. That's all we can say about it. And the top, really, we can't say very much about it at all. Apparently, some people get very excited about this kind of thing. I can't get very excited about the, the, um, this programming by contract model because it is too incomplete. You can't actually say anything useful with it. I mean, really, there's not a lot here that you can do. This is probably one of the weakest specifications you're ever likely to see. And it's probably one of the reasons people weren't very impressed with formal methods. Um, it doesn't tell me what was in the stack. When I asked for top, I have no idea what's there. You, it returns something. It's not very helpful. Kind of hoped it would. But, you know, that's it. Um, now, what is interesting is that if we um, switch this to um, C++, I can say the same thing. I've got a few tweaks for conventions in C++. The reason I picked uh, switching from Java to C++ is because C++ 23 is due to have pre and post conditions. It was due to be C20, but people couldn't really agree on certain things. Um, so, yes, the joy of committees. Um, but here is what it will look like, unless they change it again, in um, C23. We use pre and post, but you'll actually see there's some stuff missing. It turns out that an already weak specification is now almost useless. Because at this point, I can't really say anything about push, except I can't even say that the depth is one greater. Top is going to equal the new top. That's it. Um, the post condition of pop is that it won't be negative. That's it. There's not a lot going on here. There's, it's very difficult to get excited about this. And if you're actually looking very closely, you will realize those of you not familiar with um, C or C++, size T is an unsigned type. It has no negative domain. So it turns out that actually some of these are not very exciting at all. <laughs> um, and we can get rid of them. And in a few slides time, I'll show you about potentially getting rid of the preconditions. It's almost an entirely useless feature, which is maybe why people find so much scope to disagree about it. Um, this is really not as useful as it could be. If you, I've, all the examples I've ever seen of pre- and post-condition um, formal reasoning require a lot more support. Um, and even you, the fact that you can't even specify a trivial stack kind of tells you you don't want it in your application development. It's not going to be useful there unless you can do something else. However, there is, there is a formalism to the rescue. Um, and it's, it's used in a number of places. Uh, Tony Hall used it in communicating sequential processes, a formalism for reasoning about... Um, uh, concurrent uh, code. Uh, and let's go back and revisit one idea we've already had. Stack. The alphabet. He talks about the alphabet. In other words, what is the, what is the language or the symbols that are available when you're talking about stacks? Oh, there you go. But instead of looking at signatures, what he then says is, like, I want you to imagine a trace of all the behaviors from a stack. So I'm 
This is not exactly CSP, but I'm borrowing from CSP heavily. What we've got here is all the possible call sequences. All the possible call sequences you could ever have when interacting with a stack. You can create one, new. You can create one and push it. You can create one and find its depth. You can create one and push and then pop. You can create one and push and then find its top. You can create, you'll notice that there's no case where you can create one and call pop. There's no case where you can create one and call top. That simply is not allowed in the possible traces, the universe of possible traces. And you're thinking, wait a minute, how many possible uses of a stack are there? You may notice I've, el I've, I've elided a little bit of detail here. It turns out that that's quite big, infinitely big. We'll come back to infinity later. Not in an infinite amount of time, in a finite amount of time. Um, of course, if you're ever kind of, if you've got a junior developer who's just joined the team and you're not sure what they should do, you could get them to write this out. You know, that'll keep them busy. Um, they'll probably do it with great enthusiasm. Um, however, this is where state machines help us. Uh, this is how you generate uh, that sequence. You've got a new one, you've got an empty stack, you can ask for its depth, you can push, it becomes non-empty. Um, then you can call depth, top, push, and pop. If you pop and the depth is one, then it becomes empty again. Ah, this is getting a little more helpful. Now, what happens when you call top and pop in the empty state? Quite literally, it is undefined. There is no definition of that. Now, this is one of those things. What does undefined mean? It means we've not provided a behavior there, which is a fancy way of saying, don't do this. If you've ever programmed in C or C++, you'll be familiar with this. Hey, look, I've got a bug in this program. Instead of helping you, your local C++ expert will say, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Well, thanks. Yeah, that's the problem. You've got undefined behavior. Well, I'm afraid it's now being defined as a bug. Okay, which is a valid definition of undefined behavior. We didn't define it, so anything is possible. We're going to see that that has some interesting consequences later. What we normally do is we say, we don't want that. Let us map that to something that we've defined. Let's throw. Let's just say this is illegal. Okay, so how do we talk about it? Well, it turns out that we have a way of doing this, and we can reason about it. Um, so I presented uh, here some JUnit 5 code. I've, I've skipped the implementation. I just want you to focus on the names. Um, and this kind of nesting structure is quite powerful. We've got a stack spec. A new stack is empty. An empty stack throws when query for its top item. An empty stack throws when popped. An empty stack acquires depth by retaining a pushed item as its top. Uh, the one that gives you the sense of depth. A non-empty stack on popping reveals its tops in reverse order of pushing. In other words, this is history aware. It turns out that the pre and post condition model is not very good with history and state change, which is probably the one thing you care about. So this is quite useful. This is quite powerful. Um, if you've ever wondered, how do I name my tests, now you have an answer. Test push is not the answer. Okay? Um, or do test push, sorry. So the um, point here is we've now got a model here, but there's some really interesting things about this. An observation made by Jason Gorman. Hey, given when then. Given when then is one of the common patterns of unit testing, whether TDD style or BDD, behavior-driven development, Given when then, what we call a or triple. Well, that's the Tony Hall stuff. That's that. Turns out, this is given when then. It's the same idea. There's one unifying idea. It turns out that you don't need to know an awful lot. There's normally, at the bottom of all software development, no matter what the change is, there's a few basic ideas. Once you realize what those are, you just wait for the next terminology shift. I think we do one about now. Um, but yeah, given when then. Now, that doesn't mean that you should go ahead and put that all over your code, all over your test code, because um, it means it's not just the internal structure. It can actually you, be used to structure the nesting and hierarchy of your tests. You can write this. When a stack is created, then it is empty. Given an empty stack, when it is queried for its top item, then it throws. You can do that, but that's kind of a very excessive use of English. Um, you can keep it shorter. But if it helps you get there, absolutely, go for it. But this gives you a model of reasoning. So it turns out you can use the formal thinking. You can still use that rigorous thinking, that idea of reasoning. But you're not going to end up trapped with an incomplete formalism like um, programming by contract. Now, it turns out that one of the things you can do here, if you're trying to structure your unit tests, and people often struggle with structuring their unit tests. They often end up with a very flat thing. They don't use nesting which is an oversight. You can do this in most testing frameworks, some form of nesting. 
But how you group things, it turns out you can actually use given as a grouping construct. Or, you know, if I have common state, then I group my tests together according to the common given. If I want people to focus on the common operation, then I group by common operation. Alternatively, I can group by common outcome. Here are all the tests with the same outcome. Okay? It depends. It's up to you. But you've now got three basic ideas. It turns out the given when then thing actually informs uh, your thinking about how to reason and communicate. Now, let's go back to this. What we've seen so far um, is uh, sort of a very simple kind of stack model. Um, I've added the throws here not because that's a good practice. It really is generally considered not to be a good one in Java, but because I wanted to emphasize the decision that we took about what is the result of calling something when you're not supposed to call it. So I'm going to make that explicit here. And that's basically our interpretation of don't do that, which is the, um, uh, the partial function thing. But what if for a moment we said, let's change this. Let us have only total functions. This starts getting us into an interesting space, some of which overlaps with their concerns in functional programming. The idea of total functions, you can always call it, you will always get a result. Okay? What if we make that a first-class citizen rather than as a secondary design citizen? What do I do with this unwanted state? Shrug my shoulders, go and inform somebody that they shouldn't have called it like that, have an assertion, throw an exception, what should I do? Well, here we're going to say you can always call pop and you can always call stack. I've got an algebraic data type here. This is known rather excitingly as the bottom type. It basically means nothing, quite literally nothing. You're, when you call top, you either get a value of type T or you don't get a thing, an empty thing. Uh, it turns out there's an easier way of writing that in Java if you're busy trying to find the key for that symbol. Uh, optional. It basically means that when I pop, we effectively treat it as nothing happens. When I call top, if there's nothing there, then we get returned an empty value. Now, what that looks like from the point of view of the test is, let's just emphasize an empty stack returns an empty value as its top item. An empty stack retains, uh, remains empty when popped. So actually, this is quite nice. We've actually got tests that tell us what we're expecting in a specification-like format, but something that's communicable in uh, natural language. Now, that's kind of interesting, but I want to take a different path. We've made, the, we've made it do this. I want to try something different. I'm going to make such a simple stack that it's only going to have two operations on it, the ultimate minimal design. You can only push and you can only pop. Where do I find my depth from? Well, you can actually calculate your depth. We can basically say a few things. These are called invariants. The number of times I push must be greater than or equal to zero. The number of times I pop must be greater than or equal to zero. The number of times I push is greater than or equal to the number of times I pop. That seems reasonable. And the depth is the number of pushes minus the number of pops. Nice. What language is sufficiently minimal that we can express this? Python. So, stack is a stack. Surprises. Let's push. OK. Let's push some more. And let's pop. And what we should get is 2019. Let's pop again. What we should get is build stuff. Nice. OK. Let's try a different usage. Uh, or rather, here's the implementation before we try the different usage. Um, it's not very exciting. We're just going to use a built-in list. It does most of the work for us, and that's it. We're kind of done here. That was very exciting. What happens when we pop? What we actually get is an indexing error, even though we've got no concept of index, that comes from the underlying list. Uh, fortunately, it happens to have the right um, uh, vocabulary. Pop from an empty list, you can't do that. But we have a problem now, because strictly, this is a, an incorrect interpretation of our specification. Because now I've popped. So pop is now greater than 1. It is 1. And the number of pushes must always be greater than the number of pops. That's false, because we've not pushed. And the depth is 0 minus 1. So the depth is minus 1. Damn, this doesn't work. What we need is to change this so that when we're not empty, we provide two operations. When we're empty, we only provide one operation. We're going to have a dynamic interface. This is a property that we can get away with in Python. This is the original, uh, the origin quote um, for why we call this duck typing. 
See, a bird that walks like a duck and swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, I call that bird a duck. I think this was written in some bird-watching guide from the 1930s. We'll come back to the 1930s later. Um, and, but because we like animals, because it's a jungle, right? We've got monkeys as well. In Ruby, Python, and many dynamic pro, uh, languages, the term monkey patch only re uh, refers to dynamic modifications of a class of modular runtime. Excellent. Self-modifying code. That's what we want. So let's actually see how we're going to do this in a way that satisfies the original specification and learn an extra bit about Python and closures as well. Well, we've got a class stack. It's only got one method. You're not familiar with Python? The init method is the kind of the constructor. It's the bootstrap method. What we're going to do inside that is we're going to define four operations. The first push, the nth push, the nth pop, and the last pop. What we're going to do, and then what we're going to do is once we've, uh, our last act of initialization is that our pull, push, self.push will be the first push, because obviously the only thing you can now do is the first push. Okay, there are no other operations available. What happens once you've done the first push is that we will now replace the push operation with a new operation called nth push, because we've done the first one. But now it's going to be n equals 2, 3, 4, etc. And the pop operation will now be the last pop, because if it's the first push, it must be the last pop, last in, first out. And it's whatever last pop returns for top. The nth push, when you push, then the pop gets reinstalled as the nth pop. The nth pop, this is where it gets fun. We make a note of our own old pop operation. Then we've got a new pop operation that returns our local variable, captures closure. And then we return the new operation. And then the last pop, it's all of that again. So what we actually end up doing is we end up creating a linked list of operations in memory that are joined by scopes. Okay, so if you wondered about nested scopes, it turns out nested scopes are far more powerful than you've been given credit for in languages like C Sharp uh, and Java. Um, so what that means in practice is we now push exactly the same as before. Identical behavior. If you're running unit tests on this, you get exactly the same results. Okay? Now it gets exciting. Now we're going to pop. Now you see, it's all there. There is no attribute pop. We are unable to call pop. The number of times we've called pop is zero because there are no pop operations. Finally, we've satisfied the specification. Excellent. Not safe for work. Don't do this at work. Okay? But this is one of those things of like, if you really want to abuse a language and you really, and people say, oh, I understand stacks, do you? If you understand that, you're doing very well. Because that mixes a number more, more advanced concepts all together in one place. Okay, so to give your brains a breather from that, trouble with full stack developers, you can't push them. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're talking about stacks. An idea that is often related and talked about when we talk about stacks is queues. Um, these, are dif these differ by discipline. It turns out if you understand stacks and queues, you probably understand most of the things you will ever need to know. Okay? Um, people say, oh, yeah, is that true? Well, yeah, it is. Um, so, um, you know, a queue would be like uh, people queuing for drinks. Uh, that was me um, a few years ago. I've, I've recovered. Uh, my my co-author, Frank Bushman, and Mitchy Henning, who did a lot of work on middleware, in fact, still does a lot of work on middleware, I believe. Um, there's a nice queue of drinks there for us. But we need to understand why is it that queues are so powerful as a construct? And uh, where are we going to get to stacks again? Well, don't worry, we'll come back to stacks. So a queue is a way of all queue models break down to a producer and a consumer and a queue in the middle. This doesn't mean they're distributed. It doesn't even mean they're uh, concurrent. If you're bored of the term queue, I offer you a new profound insight, an alternative piece of terminology. A queue is a space-time decoupling. Okay, that is way more interesting. Okay, when you're having a conversation with your colleagues and you're kind of looking at stuff, it's like, yeah, we're getting all these requests in. What we need here is a space-time decoupling. Oh, that sounds so much better. A queue. Yeah, everybody's heard of queues. Yeah, message queues. All your products, all the products tend to have Q in them. And because Q is also the name of a letter in English, they all end in Q. I think that was probably cute the first time, you know, maybe in the 1970s. But we're kind of over that. Yeah. These days, we should be looking at space-time decouplings. It's much more exciting. Because that's what it is. Because you queue something up, and either you come back to it later, or it's something separate, spatially, such as a different process, or both. Right, now, how do we understand them? 
Queues have sizes, which means they're buffered, bounded, and asynchronous um, for n is greater than zero. Um, generally, infinity's not recommended. Um, this is everybody's default idea of a queue. It just, you just keep on pushing things into it. There's one problem. Your computer, even the ones in the cloud, that's not your computer, their computer, even the one in the cloud has only got finite resources. You cannot rely on this. You need to put a boundary in, because otherwise something will eventually run out. It will have rather nasty side effects on your code uh, and your runtime. So always work with bounded queues. But it gets more interesting when we think of limiting cases. What is a queue with one element in it? Yeah, we have a name for that. It's called a future. And what's the other side of it called? It's called a promise. Turns out, like I said, there are only a few ideas. Yeah? There, once you understand, oh, OK, now I've understood pretty much everything there is to do with concurrency uh, at all. In fact, if, what about n equals 0? It's unbuffered. It's synchronous. That means it's a rendezvous. Um, the default way of interpreting this, often people use a slightly different term here, it's a channel. Uh, channels were basically popularized by the um, CSP, which we've already met. Uh, the idea of how to reason about sequential processes is they communicate by channels. This is a surprisingly powerful construct. So, yeah, we shall observe the convention that channels are used for communication in only one direction between only two processes. Yeah, a really nice, simple way of doing it. So, uh, sometimes queues can be fed from multiple things. So a distinction is that a channel should only have one destination, one producer, and one consumer. That's a, it's a linguistic uh, distinction, but it can be quite powerful. Now, the language that people often associate with channels these days in this kind of approach is Go. So let's go and have a look at a stack in Go. But this time, I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to treat the stack as a separate running Go routine, effectively a mini process. I'm going to create a channel for strings that is going to be for pushing. And I'm going to create another channel called pop that is going to be um, for also for strings. But that's where I'm going to get results back. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch a function called stack with these two channels. I'm not going to deal with a stack identity at any point in time. I'm just going to communicate with effectively a concurrent running function, which is kind of cool. So the way I use it, um, I push, or rather, I've used the name so that it's suggestive. I send uh, onto the push channel build stuff. I send 2019 onto that. And when I do a print lin, this is a read from the pop channel. Receive, I get 2019. And when I do uh, a receive, then I get build stuff. Brilliant. Now, the question is, given that, again, I've gone for this minimal view, you're going, hang on, I've only got push and pop. What about all the other operations? What happens? If I try and pop an empty stack, hmm, turns out there's an answer to this. We can find this in the original CSP paper, which I think was 1978. The delay will, be never, uh, will never be ended, for example, if a group of processes are attempting communication, but none of their input and output commands correspond with each other. There is no send. I'm trying to receive, but there's nothing there. We have a name for this. And guess what? This is a valid implementation of defined behavior. So we're going to say, you're not allowed to do that. This is one of those points where your colleague comes over and says, oh, you shouldn't have done that. But I've got a problem. Yeah, you shouldn't have that problem because of the things that you've done. But if you don't do the things that you did, then you won't have that problem. Thanks. What does that look like in code? So here's the notation. I stack. I've got an input channel and out, um, I've got a, an input channel and an output channel push and pop, I'm going to use the same names. Here is my actual representation. What we've done here, if you like, is we've turned a function into an object. Here is the representation. And this function is going to continue executing. For how long? Well, forever. It's going to continue forever. And this is the first bit. If it's empty, if the depth is zero, then the only thing we can do is receive on the push channel. Somebody must be pushing to us. We are not listening to any questions about pop. They are dead to us, or they are deadlocked to us, OK? Now, I've got the alternative. What if it's not empty? Well, in that case, I could be, I'm waiting for two things. I'm selecting on either somebody wants to push to us, in which case I'm happy to receive it, and I will append it to my internal variable items. 
So what I've done is I've taken, taken a local variable, and it's now so local that it's a private instance variable, if you like, if you want to use that language. And then, if somebody wants to pop from us, then what we'll do is we will give them the last element, and then we will resize ourselves accordingly. So now we're running concurrently. This is quite nice. In fact, we can actually see an example of how the concurrency um, works, because we actually return the pop value before we actually decrease our own size. So we kind of like, here's your result, I'll get on with the housekeeping later, even though it's one statement later. Now this is all very nice, it's very iterative, it's very procedural. Um, Go is a very procedural language. If you're wondering about the paradigm, Go is a procedural language with a few extras top, uh, added on top. It's not an object-oriented language, it's not a functional language. Predominantly procedural. Um, but it has this idea of the channel-based uh, programming. Procedural coding is often associated with iteration, but if you want to get functional, you need to recurse. And recursion, that, that is truly, that, that will make your colleagues stand in awe of you. So what's that going to look like here? That's going to look like this. We're going to forever loop around the non-empty stack. We're not listening to it. So basically, the first thing we do is we receive a push. When we've received it, we are now non-empty. In the non-empty example, we've got this. And what we do is that when we receive a push, we call ourselves again non-empty. If you like, what we're now doing is we are representing ourselves on the call stack. It really is a stack. Okay? We've got no rep You'll notice I've not kept any local variables except the argument. So we've actually modeled a stack using a stack. Yeah. Oh. Fancy that. And then we return from that. Now, that's kind of cute. It's not very Go-like, but you can do it in Go. Is this not safe for work? Well, this also teaches us something else. It would be very unusual for a Go programmer, but if you're working in Erlang, that's exactly what you would do. It would look exactly like this. You would use recursion in this way. You would use this kind of replacement behavior exactly in this way, which teaches us one thing. Whenever people say this is a good practice or a bad practice, Always be a little bit suspicious. It might be a poor, bad is a very strong word. Normally it's context dependent. One of the things we often don't appreciate is that practices depend, the quality of a practice depends on where it is used. And it turns out that what is a good practice in one language may actually be a poor practice in another and vice versa. So here this turns out to be a, a different idiom, a different way of thinking. But one thing we're not going to forget is that we need to test. Testing is a good thing, generally. So how are we going to test the behaviors that we've got here? This is kind of interesting. It actually, we, we slam straight into a philosophical problem. So we're going to get our two channels. We're going to launch a stack. And now we are going to test it with a select statement. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and pop. Now, if I can pop anything, if the pop operation is successful, then it means that it's incorrectly implemented. We should not be able to pop. The stack is empty. We're not allowed to pop. So if anything comes back from the pop, or, uh, from the pop channel, that test fails the test. How do we know we've succeeded? Well, here you need a wait statement. Uh, we need to wait for, oh, there's our other infinity. Damn. By the way, just to clarify, this is not available in Go. Okay, there is no eternity, although sometimes things can feel like that in software development. There is no eternity. Um, you cannot say, well, if we succeed in waiting forever, then this code worked. I mean, you could try that with your boss. There you are, sitting with your feet up on the desk, looking at pictures of cats on the internet. And your boss says, what are you doing? I'm saying, well, I'm waiting for the test to succeed. Yeah. That, you know, we have a bit of a problem here. Uh, but we can approximate it. And I'll say one second is normally enough. So one second can feel like an eternity. This is true. But what you have just encountered is a rather interesting problem. It is related to a thing we call the halting problem, which is can we decide automatically whether or not a piece of code will terminate? Okay. Um, and it turns out that that's quite a difficult problem. It has no solution, or rather, you know, it's a, there's no way of determining in advance this will not work and therefore that will have failed, or will have passed, sorry. So, um, except we've discovered a solution. We put a timeout in. We put a finite timeout. This is how you solve the halting problem. You put a finite timeout in something. 
That means that every operation will either have a well-defined value outcome or it will time out. It might be a little bit non-deterministic, but you know, at least you've solved the halting problem. If you're wondering about why is this actually a useful concept, this relates to a number of things when you're doing network programming and things like the CAP theorem, and the idea of availability. That has a direct consequence. Now, it turns out that the halting problem is part of a family of issues that can be, at one level, considered philosophical, um, that are a limit to our knowledge. What can we know? What can we prove? Perhaps Douglas Adams put it best in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that we demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. And it turns out that we have plenty of these um, in the substrate of computer science. There are a bunch of things that are simply not provable. Um, and it's this kind of quest in maths, and eventually the part of maths that uh, uh, founded computer science, that led uh, people like Alonzo Church, well, it relates to Gödel's theorem. Uh, Alonzo Church was exploring this in the 1930s. Um, it's part of the Entscheidungs problem. An unsolvable problem of elementary number theory. Um, how do we reason about stuff? Uh, can we find out whether or not um, we can prove certain uh, statements? Are they all provable? Um, why, is I, why am I highlighting this paper? Um, because this is where he invented lambda calculus. Or rather, he invented it in a previous paper, but the 1936 paper is the one um, that uh, is quite key. Now, this is quite interesting because a lot of people have been getting very excited recently about the fact that their programming languages have been adding lambdas. Okay, it's just like, yeah, so Java, since 2014, you can now program like it's 1936. Awesome. Um, so uh, lambda calculus is a really old idea, but it's older, it's, it's deeper than you think. This rather good paper from 2009 on understanding data abstraction by uh, uh, William Cook. Um, oh, sorry, on understanding data abstraction revisited. He goes back to a 1987 paper on understanding data abstraction. Um, uh, he makes this observation, lambda calculus was the first object-oriented language. Huh. That's kind of interesting. Now we actually see examples of that when we think about scopes. And if we go back to the early 70s, in this classic book on structured programming, there is an observation there. One of the most powerful mechanisms for program structuring is the block and procedure concept. Huh. Procedure which is capable of giving rise to block instances which survive its core will be known as a class. Instances will be known as objects of that class. That's pretty neat. So in other words, a block, instead of being discarded when you leave the function, because it's a stack after all, you've left the function, you pop something off the stack, you lose the scope. What if you keep the scope and pass it around and it has its own identity? Instances of that object will be known as class, of, of, of this will be known as classes. Um, cool, right, so um, here's some JavaScript. Um, so what I can do is I can have a very pure, it turns out hiding inside JavaScript is a very pure object model. It's, <laughs> and it's really not got out. People won't let it. They keep adding other things to the language. Uh, but what I can do is I can say I have a function that returns a thing, and I've got a private piece of state. It's a list, items, or an array, rather. I return something that holds the depth, the top, the pop. These are all themselves lambdas that refer to the local state. And this is quite neat. So what I do is I effectively return a set of operations, and the data, which was local variables, is held truly privately. It's so private, it's actually hidden inside a scope. Now, this is quite an interesting idea. This is a very pure object model. There is no hacking past a public-private boundary using things like reflection. This is a proper uh, object model in this sense. Um, so this is quite neat. Um, OK, but that's, there's more to object orientation than this. We've got the data abstraction side. What about the inheritance side? Well, back in the uh, early 70s, it wasn't really called in, in, um, inheritance, late 60s and early 70s, um, the terminology that was used for the Simulus 67 language was concatenation. Concatenation is an operation between two classes, A and B, and results in the formation of a new class or block. Concatenation consists of merging the attributes, both components, and um, the composition of their actions. Well, actually, this is fairly easy given that JavaScript is uh, it's fairly duct typed. Uh, what we can do is we can actually ha change our language a little bit and say, well, what I've got is a stackable property. I'm going to take an object. It'll be my base. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to overwrite, I'm going to add over, or, or override existing methods with new behaviors. So that's kind of neat. So what that looks like in practice is that my new stack operation now just becomes a stackable of, well, we'll start with nothing. 
So now you've got this idea that I can, the idea of inheritance is actually a function-based operation. And let us also add in extra behavior. Perhaps we want it to be clearable as well. So not, apart from just push and pop, I can also clear it. Okay, we'll uh, add this one in. So now I can now create my new stack so that it is stackable and clearable. I could even tidy up the operations and say multiple inheritance or multiple composition um, using some bits and pieces here. The style of programming that we're encouraging here or pursuing is known as mix-in programming. This became, um, this was kind of effectively invented in the 1980s uh, in the Lisp community when they were exploring uh, object-oriented systems. Uh, so how do we use it? Well, concept hierarchies. The construction principle involved is best called abstraction. We concentrate on features common to many phenomena. We abstract away features too far removed from the conceptual level at which we are working. That's pretty cool. Now, how do we, what does that mean in practice for how you organize class hierarchies? So there's one thing as a consultant that I can tell you is whenever I see anybody using inheritance, there's a pretty good chance they're not using it well, or they're using it for code reuse. But it probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And it turns out we've got, a, we've got a guiding principle. Barbara Liskoff again in her 87 paper. A type hierarchy is composed of subtypes and supertypes. The intuitive idea of a subtype is one whose objects provide all the behavior of objects of another type, supertype, plus something extra. And she had a more rigorous formalization of it. Blah, blah, blah. Such there is an object type, et cetera, et cetera. OK. What does that look like in practice? Well, let's add a new operation or a new capability. Let's mix in a new capability. For my stack, I'm going to have the idea of a non-duplicate top. What does that mean? It means that when I push onto a stack and it already has that value, then it won't bother pushing the new one again. Okay? So if I push A and I push B and then I push B again, it'll just be A and B. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix this behavior in. And it turns out one of the things that the Liskov substitution principle, so Barbara Liskov coined this in 1987, but it was popularized by uh, Jim Kaplin in 1992 as, as LSP. Um, we can write a test. It turns out that this is one of those principles you can actually write tests for. You can actually demonstrate whether or not something passes or meets LSP just by writing a test. So here I've got a set of tests. A non-empty stack becomes deeper by retaining a pushed item as its top. So I'm going to push build stuff, push 2019, push 2019. Stack depth is equal to 3. If you're not familiar with JavaScript, if you want something to be considered equal to something else, you have to really, really want it to be equal. Just keep your finger down on the equals key. It'll eventually be equal enough. Um, and so, therefore, what we're saying is stacks have this property. You push three things, you've got three things, okay? The number of pushes minus the number of pops is the depth, okay? So that's simple invariant. And the top should be 2019. Now, if we apply this to a clearable, stackable object, then it passes. It's green. If, however, we apply it to something that mixes in the non-duplicate behavior, which basically says... You cannot have this. Although we might call it a stack, and it's kind of like a stack, it's not a stack according to our definition. Our definition says you push three things, you got three things. Anything else is a violation. So it turns out that although sometimes things, some of these principles, like LSP, can seem a little abstract, actually they're quite concrete. You, they are testable. Okay? And we've got a very specific meaning. Now, I want to close by zooming out of this stuff, because we've looked at a lot of stuff which is kind of very computer science it's very specification-oriented. We may have learned a couple of things about programming language design, a couple of ideas about crazy things that we don't want to do at work, or things that we can now use in code reviews. You know, we can talk about space-time decouplings. We can just tell people, instead of don't do that, you can say, ah, you can do that if you, you know, and now you can spout a whole load of pseudo-maths at them. Um, it's great. So that's just perhaps improves your ability to communicate crazy ideas. But we all need to understand where this lives. So I'm going to close by considering a framework from Meyer Lehman uh, from a paper he wrote in 1980. We can characterize code as S, P, or E. What we've been looking at is code where the function is formally defined by and derivable from a specification, like a stack, sorting routine, like an accountancy system. It turns out the rules of accountancy are classic in this sense. It turns out a lot of domains have a well-defined set of rules. 
Okay? And if somebody gave you that set of rules, I'm not saying that developing software is trivial, but you could write tests against that. And you could say, we have a very clear idea of what is a right answer and what is a wrong answer. If somebody says, in a banking system, I've just, pushed, I've just put 100 euros into that account, then if that account is only credited 99 euros and 99 cents, that's not close. That's wrong. Okay? Technical term for that is wrong. So, you know, whereas I know there's a lot of developers going, yeah, that's almost 100, that's close enough. No. Banking has a very clear idea of the right and wrong answer. So these are all S-class systems. A lot of the stuff that we do, certainly in the small parts, is S-based. We can definitely say, if I told you what the problem was, you might, it doesn't mean you're going to code it instantly, but I can tell you, I can give you a good idea of what I'm expecting in terms of unit tests and correctness. It gets more interesting when we look at P. The acceptability of a solution is determined by the environment in which it is embedded. This moves us actually, curiously enough, although this was written in 1980, which is five years before um, back propagation in neural networks was established by Rummel, Hart, and McClelland, this is actually a very good way of thinking about how we reason about uh, machine learning. We don't know what the answer should be. And there's no fixed way of saying that is the right answer and that is wrong. Well, <laughs> one way of doing it is let's put the system into production and see if we get lots of bad press. If you get lots of bad press, then that was probably wrong. But again, you need a time machine to negotiate, to go back to yourself and say, don't do that. In other words, it means that the outcome is negotiable. This is kind of interesting, because with an S system, the outcome is not negotiable. We know what the right answer should be. We're not necessarily sure how to build it. But what we've said here is we're not sure what the right answer is, and we're not sure how to build it. So it opens up. It's negotiable. This is a very different class of problem and thinking. We hear E programs, programs that mechanize a human or societal activity. The program has become a part of the world it models, it is embedded in it. That means the outputs of the program will change the world, and the result of the world will change the inputs to the program. This is kind of big. Well, actually, it can be quite small. It means this relates to everything from um, uh, uh, any car, any software that you use in a car, to social media. It turns out that those little pieces of code that we find correct, and it's the classic stuff of computer science, we often focus in and say, yes, I've got this, the unit test passed, or I've formally proven, in very rare cases, this behavior. What it tells us is that that's still not a full stack. Fun as the stack stuff is, it turns out there's more. You, if you really want to understand how your code works, even if it's just two lines of code, to understand its applicability, you have to go outside. You have to kind of look. The full stack really does take in um, the world and the people around it. Anyway, I hope that's been fun, enlightening, infuriating, giving you some crazy ideas for something you might want to check in on Monday. And don't blame me. You can't, you can't, you're not allowed to commit with my name. I saw this at a talk and build stuff. I think self-modifying code is the way to go. Also, let's encourage people to deadlock code. Please don't blame me, but thank you very much. Oh, I've got one question. Where did you get that amazing shirt? Yeah, this is, uh, I've got a whole line of Wayland yutani um, shirts at home uh, that, from Alien. Uh, honestly, I can't remember which, which one this was. Uh, it might have been Uber Torso. I've got a feeling it might have been my second Nostromo uh, t-shirt. Thank you.